Hi, I'm Tom, coming to you from the world headquarters of the International Institute for the Advancement of Sourdough Science and Research of Cleveland, Ohio, also known as My Kitchen. Thank you for selecting this video. Today's video is a continuation of the series, When is Bulk Fermentation Done? This is the seventh episode in this important video series that helps beginning sourdough bakers answer this most complicated question, when is bulk fermentation done? In today's video, we will be focused on the most important variable in bulk fermentation, and that is temperature. There is no single variable in bulk fermentation more important than temperature. Now, when I think about sourdough baking, if you want to master sourdough baking, you need to master bulk fermentation. And if you want to master bulk fermentation, you need to master the interplay of temperature and time. So in today's video, we will focus on all aspects of managing temperature in bulk fermentation, and we will assess the impact that that has on the overall time of bulk fermentation. Now, if you're interested in this topic, I have another video series that I created last year. It's a three-part series called Bulk Fermentation, Mastering Temperature and Time. That is a three-hour set of videos that goes through tremendous detail of all aspects of temperature in bulk fermentation. What I'll be doing today is creating a shorter version of that, and I'll reference some of the things that I cover in that video series, such as how to calculate desired dough temperature, how to, how to use a proofing chamber, the impact of different temperatures on fermentation times, and the science behind that. I go into that in tremendous detail in that other video. Rather than rehash all of that today, when I get to those points, if you want to have more detail about some of those topics, I'll refer you to that other video, which I'll refer to as the prior video, the other video, the temperature and time video, and I'll put the links in the description of this video so that you can go directly to those chapters. So why is it important to master this interplay between temperature and time in bulk fermentation? There are really two reasons. One is that all the organisms in your starter that essentially ferment the dough during bulk fermentation are temperature sensitive organisms. When the temperature is warm, they operate faster. When the temperature is cool, they operate more slowly. So we need to understand temperature and understand that interplay with the organisms in the starter and the impact that that has on your bulk fermentation. By understanding how to speed up and slow down bulk fermentation with temperature, you can control your baking schedule. So if you wanna accelerate your baking schedule, you can increase your bulk fermentation temperature. If you wanna slow down your baking schedule, you can decrease your bulk fermentation temperature. So as a sourdough baker, this is an essential tool in managing your baking schedule. And this is one of the most important tools because of the long length of time that it takes to make a sourdough loaf. The second reason that we're focused on temperature is because it's just a factor of working year round in your kitchen. You will have seasonal variations in your kitchen temperature, and you need to know what impact that will have on your bulk fermentation. Now, one of the most common problems that I see in sourdough baking, I participate in many social media groups, is that a lot of people learn to do sourdough baking during the winter for some reason. They get sourdough baking books as Christmas gifts. They bake during the winter, and then all of a sudden summer rolls around. Their kitchen temperature is warmer. They're trying to do overnight proofing. They're trying to stick to their standard timing, and they start overproofing their loaves, and all of their timing and schedules go out the window because their kitchen temperature has significantly increased. So you have to be able to anticipate that impact of changes in your kitchen temperature on bulk fermentation. And there are other people who live in parts of the world, unlike Cleveland, Ohio, where you just have to know how to do warm weather baking because you might be living in a tropical location or in an area of the world where you're just baking in a warm kitchen all the time. And a lot of the recipes that you might follow are not calibrated for warm weather baking. So what we'll cover in today's video are really what are the tools that you need to be able to manage bulk fermentation in a warm weather environment as well. So in today's video, we'll be following the same recipe I use in all these videos, the tartine bread basic country loaf recipe. 
That's the standard across all of my experiments. Now in that recipe, the recommended bulk fermentation temperature is 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 25.5 to 28 degrees Celsius. That's the standard recommended range. In today's video, we are going to deviate from that temperature range and see what impact that has on our bulk fermentation time. So we'll be bulk fermenting dough today at three different temperatures, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. That's still relatively warm for a room temperature loaf. We're going to bulk ferment at the 82, which is the high end of the range, degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius. That's gonna be our baseline loaf that we can compare back to the recipe and to other videos in this series. And then we will bulk ferment at 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius. That is a really warm bulk fermentation temperature and about as high as you can go. Now I've tried this in some other videos and some other experiments and a lot of bad things can happen when you start bulk fermenting up there at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. But we're gonna try that today for two reasons. One is to see what's the warmest temperature you could bulk ferment your dough at if you're trying to accelerate your bulk fermentation time. And I think 90 is about the max. And the second reason is to say, what if I'm baking in a warm climate where my kitchen is 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius? What impact is that going to have on my outcome of my bulk fermentation? So those are the three temperatures that we'll be working at, but I'm actually going to make two loaves at the 82 degree Fahrenheit, 28 degree Celsius bulk fermentation temperature, because I'm also going to test one other theory here today. So we're going to get a little bonus test also related to temperature. And this is related to final proofing temperatures. So a lot of people who follow the tartine bread recipe do an overnight cold retard final proof. That's what I typically do in a lot of these experiments. After we finish pre-shaping the dough, at the end of bulk fermentation and shaping, we then put the loaves into the refrigerator for an overnight cold retard. That tends to do that final proofing very slowly and it builds up a lot of the sour flavor by bringing that temperature down over time. There's another option in this recipe in the book uh, and that is the same day countertop proof. So instead of doing an overnight cold retard, you can also take a loaf and do a final proof on the countertop for about three to four hours. So I'm going to do that experiment for my 82 degree Fahrenheit, 28 degree Celsius loaf. We're gonna make two loaves at that temperature. They're gonna go two different paths. One path will do the overnight cold retard, which is our standard. And the other loaf, we're gonna do a countertop proof and see how does three or four hours on the countertop compare to 12 to 14 hours in the refrigerator, which is a question that a lot of people ask. So we're gonna do a highly controlled experiment, two loaves going down the same path and then split them at that final proofing temperature. So that's the basics of the experiment and the recipe that we will be following. Let me just put the details on the screen of the type of flour that I'm using today. This is the exact same type of flour that I've used in all seven of these videos, when is bulk fermentation done series. And they have some other details here about the recipe if you're not familiar with that. So I follow this recipe by the book. I'll do it exactly as written. I recommend buying this book if you don't have it. If you don't want to buy the book, you can also download the basic country loaf recipe from the Tartine Bakery website. So before we dive into the experiment, let's just talk a little bit about the impact of temperature on bulk fermentation. Temperature impacts bulk fermentation in two ways. When you change the temperature in bulk fermentation, it, it changes the time of bulk fermentation. And when you change the temperature of bulk fermentation, it changes the chemistry of the dough. Let's talk about time first. So the obvious way to think about this is when you increase your bulk fermentation temperature, your time speeds up. When you decrease your temperature, the time slows down. The complicating factor is that it's a nonlinear relationship. So a 10 degree increase in temperature doesn't have the same effect as a 10 degree decrease in temperature. Or if you went from 70 degrees to 80 degrees Fahrenheit, for example, that change in time would be different than if you went from 80 degrees Fahrenheit to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, because everything happens faster at warmer temperatures. There's an exponential curve running behind the bulk fermentation process because that's how the microbes operate. So when we try to understand what's happening in bulk fermentation, it's helpful to think of it at that microbial level of what's happening with the yeast and lactic acid bacteria. Let's talk about what happens with the yeast. 
Now we want our yeast to be eating starches and sugars and it creates carbon dioxide and that's what inflates our gluten matrix that rises the dough. That's the primary purpose of the yeast in bulk fermentation. Very simply, when the temperature is low, the yeast slows down. When the temperature is warm, the yeast speeds up. So for example, in the book, when we start with that target temperature of say 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, the yeast is eating at a steady pace. If we then turn the temperature down from 82 degrees Fahrenheit down to 75 degrees Fahrenheit or 24 degrees Celsius, the yeast slows down. The yeast eats slower. The yeast produces carbon dioxide more slowly. Then when we turn the temperature back up and we go from 75 degrees past 82 degrees up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius, the yeast speeds up. The yeast eats faster. The yeast creates more carbon dioxide. The yeast reproduces faster. It's a direct relationship between the temperature and the activity in the yeast. So what we need to be able to, to do is to predict what that impact is when you go from a low temperature up to a high temperature and what impact that has on the yeast production. Now the lactic acid bacteria is also temperature sensitive and it also, similar to the yeast, produces faster at higher temperatures. But the thing that the lactic acid bacteria is doing is it's not creating carbon dioxide to fill the gluten matrix like the yeast, it's creating acid. And acid can have detrimental impacts on your loaf. The acid that's created in the lactic acid bacteria adds the flavor to a sourdough loaf, but when your dough gets very acidic, it slows down the fermentation of the yeast. The yeast does not like an acidic environment. And the really bad thing that happens at high temperatures, usually above about 87 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 to 32 degrees Celsius, is that the lactic acid bacteria stimulates something called the protease enzyme. The protease enzyme is the uninvited party guest in your starter. Protease enzyme eats protein. The protein in our dough is gluten. So when the temperature starts to get high, the acidity starts to get high, the yeast slows down, which is a bad thing. And a really bad thing is that the thing that loves acidity is the protease enzyme. It gets released into your dough and it eats the gluten. And this is what causes classic overproofing where your loaf deteriorates and deflates. So when I talk about the temperature, impacting the chemistry of the dough. That's what happens when you start to get up into the high 80s Fahrenheit or the low 30s Celsius, is the dough becomes acidic, you release the protease enzyme and bad things can happen to your dough. So to better understand what's happening at the microbial level with these temperature changes, I like to think about it as an analogy of a party. So let's say that we wanna rise our dough so we invite our yeast to come to a party. We want them to eat flour and create carbon dioxide to rise the loaf. The yeast brings an uninvited party guest with them, the lactic acid bacteria. So the yeast sits in the living room and they're basically creating a quilt. They're creating a quilt out of gluten and instead of putting batting inside the gluten, they're putting carbon dioxide inside of the gluten and that's what's rising the dough. At a temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit, the yeast is drinking tea. It's making the quilt at a slow pace, sitting in its sewing circle. And the lactic acid bacteria, they're like the young adults. They're down in the basement. They're listening to some light rock music from the 1970s and kind of minding their own business. When the temperature gets up to 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius, the yeast starts to work a little bit faster. They're drinking some tea. They're getting a little bit of effect from the caffeine in the tea. They're eating some cucumber sandwiches. They're really pumping out the quilt now and they're filling it up with carbon dioxide. And the lactic acid bacteria at that same temperature down in the basement, there's a little dancing going on. They got the record player running the Saturday Night Fever LPs and the music's getting a little bit loud. There might be a little bit of drinking down there. So the lactic acid bacteria starts to get a little bit stimulated at that temperature. Then when we go up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, the yeast is sitting in the living room. Now they're doing shots of whiskey in their tea. They're moving really fast. A couple of them are taking a nap because they're worn out. And the young people come up from the basement and now they're going crazy. They're doing beer bongs in the kitchen. 
They're emptying the liquor cabinet. They're punching holes in the wall. They got a real party going on and they're dropping acid. They're building that acid load in the dough. And what happens is they bring their suitcase full of protease enzyme that pops open at 87 degrees Fahrenheit or 31 degrees Celsius. And out come these little Pac-Men that go around and start eating gluten. So the Pac-Men start going around the party, going to the living room, messing up the sewing circle, and they eat the quilt. They eat the gluten, they deflate all the work that the sewing circle did, and the whole party goes to hell. So that's the challenge of working at high temperatures, is the party's a lot of fun, but a lot of bad things can happen. So how do you deal with this challenge of bulk fermenting at warm temperatures when you have this inherent change of the chemistry that wants to break down the gluten? There's one thing that you can do, and that is to de-acidify your starter when you're working at high temperatures. So the way that you do this is that when you, when you add your starter to your dough, you have a couple options of how to do that. You could use a tired old starter that has a very high acid load. If you put that into your dough and you start bulk fermenting at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, you're gonna overproof that loaf really quickly because you're starting with a lot of acid in your starter. So the way you de-acidify your starter is basically to do frequent feedings, high feeding ratios, a couple of days before you wanna bake at high temperature, and that gets the acid, low, acid load very low in your starter. And by starting with that low acid load, it keeps the lactic acid bacteria in the basement longer. It lets the yeast get a head start before that acid load builds up at the high temperature and it lets the yeast do its work before the party gets out of control. So the way that I dealt with this is in anticipation of this experiment, I started working on my starter two days ago because I wanted to de-acidify my starter. I want to do frequent feedings before I use it for baking. So what I did two days ago is I started in the morning with my normal one, one, one feeding ratio. That gets my, my starter set up. And normally I would let that go all day until the next morning, 24 hours later. That's my basic maintenance feeding ratio. But the next morning, that starter is pretty flat and it's pretty acidic. To, to de-acidify your starter, what you wanna do is more frequent feeding. So when I start two days prior to baking, in this example, I do something called peak to peak feeding. Peak to peak feeding means I ignore the clock. I feed my starter in the morning and then I watch for it to peak. And about one hour after it peaks, that's when your yeast is at its maximum population. I don't care what time of day it is, I discard and feed again. And you can do one, 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 two, two, one, three, three. It really doesn't matter what that feeding ratio is. All you're doing with the, the higher feeding ratios is stretching out the time until the next feeding. So I might do another one, one, one feeding ratio if it's the middle of the day and I'm home and I can tend to my starter. But then in that evening when it peaks, I know that I have to make it through the night before I'm gonna feed it again. So then I'll bump up my feeding ratio to one, two, two, or one, three, three to make sure that my starter is peaking then in the morning. So I did a one, three, three feeding ratio to really fatten that up, give it a lot of food. Then the next morning, it was just post peak on day, uh, basically one day ago. And then I repeat that process again through the day before I wanna bake. And then this morning, I just topped this off again. I fed this about four hours ago with a one, one, one feeding ratio, just to make sure that it's peaking right at the time that I wanna get it into my loaf, into the dough. So what does my starter look like? It's super airy. It doesn't smell acidic at all. This smells like a yeast factory. It smells like yeast. It smells milky and I don't sense any acidity in this. And this is just past peak from when I fed it this morning. So this is about as far along as we want this to go. So I'm gonna get this into our dough. So this is what a de-acidified starter looks like. Really frothy and light, no acidic smell to it at all. And you can see that this is starting to sink down a little bit. I try to catch this right after it peaks, about one hour after it peaks. That's when your yeast is at the maximum population. But we don't have any time to waste based on where that starter is right now, so let's start mixing the dough.
Now in episode six of this series, I did a really fascinating experiment on the importance of starter strength in baking. And if you haven't seen that, I recommend watching episode six because the results were really extraordinary. I, I showed through the course of two experiments that by having a stronger starter at the beginning of your bulk fermentation process, it almost cut my bulk fermentation times in half versus a prior experiment where I was using a weak starter. So I'm much more focused on getting my starter in optimal shape now here before I bake. So for today's experiment, I'm actually gonna do something called the float test. There's a lot of controversy around the float test about whether it works, whether it's, it doesn't, whether it's reliable or whether it's not reliable. I like to do it just so we have a data point so that going forward, we can create some objective criteria to say, what does a strong low acid starter look like and behave like? So what you do with the float test, you scoop out a spoonful of starter. That's incredibly bubbly and beautiful looking. You drop that into a cup of water. And if it floats, which it is floating, that indicates that your starter is ready for baking. So the float test was popularized in the Tartine Bread book. Chad Robertson strongly recommends it. And if you follow the recommended recipe for how he creates a starter and how he creates a leaven, it's a fairly reliable test for this recipe. Now I'm going to do some of the mixing off camera, but there's one very important technique that you need to understand when you're working at different bulk fermentation temperatures, and that is something called the desired dough temperature calculation. So I'm gonna mix up a few of these, and then I'll come back, and we, when we do loaf four, I'll go through the desired dough temperature calculation for that loaf and show you how to do that. So before I mix the dough, let's recap what I found in the prior experiment in the video Bulk Fermentation Mastering Temperature and Time, and we'll use the insight from that experiment to modify what we do in bulk fermentation here. So in that experiment, I did the same thing. I, I bulk fermented four loaves at three different temperatures, the same temperature, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, 82 Fahrenheit, 28 Celsius, 90 Fahrenheit, 32 Celsius. Here's a chart of what the bulk fermentation times looked like. So what we can see here is that the 75 degree loaf took seven and a half hours to bulk ferment. The 82 degree, 28 degree Celsius loaf took five hours and the 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degree Celsius loaf took three and a half hours. So what we can do then is take these formulas and go off of the baseline of the tartine recipe that I'm calling that the 82 degree loaf, 28 degree Celsius loaf that says if we reduce the temperature by seven and a half degrees Fahrenheit, four degrees Celsius down to that 75 degree Fahrenheit, 24 Celsius, that will increase the bulk fermentation time typically by 50%. So if my standard takes five hours, for example, it would take seven and a half hours at that reduced temperature. Then if we increase the temperature from 82 degrees Fahrenheit up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius, that reduces the bulk fermentation time by 30%. And you can see there, those numbers are different. It's not a 50% decrease and a 50% increase because of the shape of that fermentation curve, it's nonlinear. So when we think about modifying our process to be able to predict the bulk fermentation times at different temperatures, you have to go back to this concept that the yeast doesn't understand time the yeast only knows temperature and the yeast thinks the clock is a thermometer. So if I turn the thermometer up, the yeast goes faster. If I turn the thermometer down, the yeast goes slower. So this adjustment is something I call yeast standard time. So by using the results of the prior experiment, that 50% increase by, in time by decreasing the temperature and the 30% decrease in time by increasing the temperature, we can create a chart here that takes all the time steps in bulk fermentation, the rest after the initial mix, the rest after adding the salt, the rest between stretch and folds, the total estimated bulk fermentation time and the rest after pre-shaping. That middle column shows the standards from the tartine recipe. And I'm counting bulk fermentation starting from the minute we add the starter to the flour and water. That's really when the clock should start. By adjusting these times, we're essentially tricking the yeast. We're replacing the clock with a thermometer because the yeast can't tell time. All we're doing is manipulating the temperature, but I have to manipulate the time 
to be consistent with that. And the yeast will think that 30 minutes at 82 degrees Fahrenheit is exactly the same as 45 minutes at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, for example. So by following these adjusted times, we're adapting our time to yeast standard time. We stretch out the times at lower temperatures. We shorten the times at higher temperatures so that our clock operates with the yeast's clock, which is a thermometer. So the idea behind this experiment is that we adjust our time based on the temperature change and bake four loaves of bread at very different bulk fermentation and proofing times. And at the end of the experiment, if this works, all four of these loaves, even though they were made at different times and temperatures, should come out looking exactly the same. Now in today's experiment to determine when bulk fermentation is done, we will be using the incredible Bulkomatic system. If you've seen other episodes in this series, you're familiar with this tool. If you haven't seen any of those episodes, I recommend that you watch episode three, where we introduce the tool that we developed here at the Institute that helps us determine when bulk fermentation is done. This is a nine factor test to determine when to cut off bulk fermentation but this is calibrated specifically for the temperature in the tartine bread recipe, which is the 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 25.5 to 28 degrees Celsius. What we're gonna to do today is vary the temperature, which is factor number one, and that will vary the time, which is factor number two. So we're essentially ignoring the guidance on items number one and two, temperature on time. We're gonna set the temperature at these three different points and let the process tell us what the end time is so that when we're done all of these loaves should come out looking exactly the same because we're going to use other objective criteria and ignore temperature and time. Now I've mixed up the ingredients for loaves one, two, and three. I'm getting ready to mix up loaf number four and I'm going to demonstrate this mixing because I want to demonstrate a technique here called desired dough temperature. Desired dough temperature is basically a formula that you can use to determine what your water temperature needs to be when you're mixing your ingredients to get your overall dough temperature up to where you want it to be for bulk fermentation. Now, when you're bulk fermenting dough at warm temperatures, so this would be an example if I'm trying to speed up my bulk fermentation and I wanna get all my ingredients up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, I need to add fairly hot water to the mix because my Flour is at room temperature, my starter is roughly at room temperature, and when I combine those ingredients, the only way I can pull the temperature up is with the water temperature. So the desired dough temperature calculation is something you can find on the internet. These are overly simplistic methods that are used in commercial bakeries, and they're highly dependent on room temperature and something called the friction factor, which is an amount of heat that's added to the dough through the friction of mixing the dough in a mixer. When you try to use the standard desired dough temperature calculations for hand mixing sourdough, it doesn't really work very well, especially when your temperature starts to diverge from room temperature, which ours is very different from room temperature. We're trying to get this dough up to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. When I use the standard desired dough temperature calculation, that would tell me to add water that's 141 degrees Fahrenheit, that's higher than the, what the yeast can tolerate before you kill off the yeast at 130 degrees Fahrenheit or 54 degrees Celsius. That would be 61 degrees Celsius water. So that formula is unreliable at moving the dough up to high temperatures, so I don't use it. So if you look at the other video, bulk fermentation, mastering temperature and time, I create a formula that I go through in great detail in that video, which is basically a gram weighted and density adjusted formula where I just weigh all the ingredients, I take the temperature of all the ingredients, and I use basic algebra to solve for what the water temperature should be based on the weight of all the ingredients. Now that doesn't work strictly based on weight because water has a different density than your starter and your flour, and the water has more heat trapping capacity. So if you're interested in learning about the desired dough temperature calculation that I'm using here, the, the the gram weighted density adjusted formula. Watch that prior video where I go through it in great detail. I'm gonna go through the steps here and I'll put the formula up on the screen at the end so you can see it, but I'm not gonna explain all the detail and go through the theory of why this works. So here at the Institute, I've built a working replica 
of the ENIAC computer. That was the first supercomputer ever developed. I have it in my basement here at the Institute. And I've hooked it up to this old Texas Instruments calculator that I dug out of my relics. And what I do here is I type in the flower temperature, which is 72 degrees Fahrenheit, 22 degrees Celsius, and the quantity of flour in grams. I type in the starter temperature, which is 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 23.3 degrees Celsius, and I put in the grams of starter. And then I put in the desired temperature that I want this to be at after mixing, which is 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, and I put in the total gram weight of the dough. And then just using you know basic algebra, you can back into what the water temperature should be. But I also do an adjustment for the density and the heat trapping capacity of the water, where I put in two adjustment factors that I'll show on the end here. And that tells me my water temperature should be, get my printout here, there it is, that's pretty cool. My water temperature should be 108 degrees Fahrenheit or 42.1 degrees Celsius. That sounds pretty warm because we're trying to get a dough temperature of 90 degrees Fahrenheit. So my water temperature is 18 degrees Fahrenheit warmer. I'm gonna show you what happens here and why you need the water to really overshoot the target by that much. Here's the detail of the desired dough temperature calculation that I use today. This is the gram weighted density adjusted formula. You can pause here to look at this in more detail, or you could watch the prior video where I go through all of these steps as well. So the first thing that I do is I have my 108 degree water. I heated this up in the microwave. And the way that I like to add the ingredients is I start with the starter or your leaven. So we're gonna add 50 grams of leaven. My leaven is at 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 23 degrees Celsius. So I've added 50 grams of leaven. Now I'm going to add 175 grams of my 108 degree Fahrenheit water. That's 42.1 degrees Celsius. Now this is 108 degrees. I just took the temperature. I've heated this up in my microwave. But think about what's happening here. My bowl is at room temperature. My starter is at about room temperature. So I'm gonna add this in. One seventy five. Now I'm going to take the temperature. Now this is incredible. I took 108 degree Fahrenheit water out of this container. I dumped it into this bowl and it's down to 95 degrees Fahrenheit because I poured it into a cold bowl and I had my starter, which was 74 degrees Fahrenheit. So it pulled that temperature down a lot. Now I'm going to stir in my starter to try to blend it in a little bit. I like to break that up. Take the temperature again. I just did a few seconds of stirring. 93 degrees Fahrenheit. So I lost two degrees Fahrenheit. That's 34 degrees Celsius just by stirring because I'm introducing room temperature air. Now I add my flour. This may actually undershoot my target. Okay, I've just barely got the ingredients combined here. Take the temperature again. 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's our target. So it's amazing how much that temperature drops from that high water temperature. But now I need to keep mixing this. It's at 90 degrees Fahrenheit. The longer I mix this, the temperature will keep dropping because I'm introducing room temperature air into this. So I don't wanna over mix this and drop my temperature too much. So I've just done another 30 seconds of mixing. 89 degrees Fahrenheit. So now we're under our target. So I'm gonna stop here and I'm gonna get this into my proofing chamber. I can mix this a little bit more when I add the salt. That's our shaggy massive dough per the recipe. This goes into the proofing chamber. Now let's talk about proofing chambers.
So if you're gonna be managing your bulk fermented dough at a temperature different than your room temperature, you need to know about proofing chambers. A proofing chamber is basically an enclosed space where you can control the temperature of your dough to either make it higher or lower than your room temperature. Now in my other video, Bulk Fermentation, Mastering Temperature and Time, I go through this in a lot of detail and I show examples of both ways to increase your dough temperature above your room temperature and decrease your dough temperature to get it below your room temperature. For example, if you're in a tropical or very warm environment. In today's example, I'm just going to show you what I'm doing here and not all the options. So you get an idea of how I'm using proofing chambers to manage my dough temperature here today. So in today's example, we have dough temperatures of 74 degrees Fahrenheit, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 24 degrees Celsius, 28 degrees Celsius, 32 degrees Celsius. So for that low temperature range, the 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, I'm just using my room temperature for that. It's the middle of winter here. It's a little warmer than I normally keep my room temperature, but I turned on my fireplace. I turned up my thermostat. So my countertop temperature here is 74.8 degrees Fahrenheit, close to 75, which is 24 degrees Celsius. That's right where we wanna be for loaf number one. So I'm just keeping this on my countertop at room temperature. That one's easy. If you can control your room temperature, to make it your desired bulk fermentation temperature. You don't need a, a, a separate proofing box for that. I'm basically using my entire kitchen as a proofing box by jacking my temperature up a few degrees higher than normal. So this is a big box proofing box. For loaves two and three, these are the loaves I'm trying to keep at 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius. What I use for that proofing chamber is my oven with my light turned on. So I usually turn the light on about an hour before I start my mixing process because it'll take a little while for the light bulb in your oven to get your temperature up. And I always put a thermometer in the oven so I know what the temperature is because it'll keep creeping up over time. It'll start at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, then it'll creep up to 83 degrees Fahrenheit, 84 degrees Fahrenheit. If I start to overshoot my target of 82 degrees Fahrenheit or 28 degrees Celsius, I just crack the door open a little bit and I monitor that thermometer in the oven when it gets back down to 82, I close the door again. I use that all the time for my proofing, it works really well. Now in some cases, for example, if you're starting off in a very cold environment, so in the middle of winter, my oven sometimes is really cold and it'll take too long for the light bulb to bring the temperature up. In that case, if you need to make a big jump in temperature fairly quickly, I heat up a liter of boiling water in the microwave and I'll put this into the oven either before I put the dough in or sometimes with the dough. And this will move the temperature up in there very quickly. You have to refresh this from time to time if you're gonna use boiling water in lieu of a light bulb, for example. I usually use this in advance of the light bulb getting up to temperature to try to move up six, eight, 10 degrees Fahrenheit really quickly. Then I take this out and let the light bulb maintain that temperature at the target that I need to be. Now for my 90 degree loaf, that's loaf number four, I have a warming drawer here under my counter. It actually has a proof setting on it, but you'll find on a lot of ovens and warming drawers, the proof settings are way too high for sourdough baking. So don't be deceived into just setting uh, your oven or a warming drawer on the proof setting and assuming that it's calibrated for sourdough. It usually isn't. It's usually over 100 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 40 degrees Celsius. And that's more for proofing commercially yeasted bread using baker's yeast. It's much too hot for sourdough proofing, as I discussed earlier. So I can't use the proof setting. I'm basically just using the metal box. And what I have in here is this warming mat. This is called a reptile warming mat. It's a seven watt mat. Comes with this little dimmer switch on here. And I put this in that drawer and I can control that temperature right at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. In fact, I'm looking at it right now. It's 90.9 .9 degrees Fahrenheit, which is 33 degrees Celsius, one degree higher Fahrenheit than where I, than where I wanna be. But that's a good temperature and I'll get that back down to exactly 90. So once you get these set up, they're fairly easy to keep the dough temperature in that range. The thing you have to realize when you're trying to manage your dough temperature though, is that the biggest swings in temperature of your dough come in those early mixing steps. 
that's where you can really move the temperature up by using warmer water, but it's also where the temperature will drop quickly. Every time you touch that dough and you're exposing it to room temperature air as you're mixing the dough, that temperature wants to come down. So that's a real art form to try to use water to get your temperature up, use the air to get your temperature down. Some cases you need to do that. And if you come out of those mixing steps with your dough really under temperature, say by five degrees Fahrenheit, for example, which would be two or three degrees Celsius, it takes a while to move that temperature back up just through the ambient temperature of the proofing chamber. So don't be discouraged if your dough is just not moving up to the desired temperature. It just takes time and you really can't rush it by trying to jack up your proofing chamber temperature because it'll overheat the outside edges of the dough. Now there is a temptation to say, my dough is under temperature, I could fix that just by jacking up my temperature. I could push it up to 95 or 100 degrees Fahrenheit in my proofing chamber, that'd be 39 degrees Celsius. Never do that. I tried that before, and now I know the reason why, because I already told you, is because the protease enzyme goes crazy when the temperature is above 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius. So you think you're doing yourself a favor by trying to pull that dough temperature up, but all you're doing is releasing an enzyme that eats the gluten and starts to overproof your dough. And even though my dough temperature was a few degrees below target, when you heat up the proofing chamber to that higher temperature, it starts to heat the outside of the dough. So it's very deceiving because if you're testing the interior sensor of your dough and it's reading 85 degrees Fahrenheit, 30 degrees Celsius, but I've jacked up my proofing chamber to 100 degrees Fahrenheit or 38 degrees Celsius, the outside edge of that dough is 100 degrees and the protease enzyme is having a party on the outside edge of your dough while you're testing the temperature in the sensor. Don't do that. You really can't push the temperature. Even doing this at 90 degrees Fahrenheit is really pushing our luck, but we'll see if it works. And then the last thing to remember if you're using a proofing chamber is that your dough is actually what's called exothermic. That means it generates heat. The fermentation process actually creates heat. So as you go through your proofing process or your bulk fermentation process, you'll see at the later stages in that process, your dough temperature will start to increase and occasionally your proofing chamber temperature will increase because the dough has become its own heating element in that space. So really always put a thermometer and monitor your proofing chamber temperatures, especially towards the end of bulk fermentation when the dough starts to throw off some of its own heat. I haven't seen a real material impact in my proofing chambers, but I see small changes in the temperature creeping up towards the end. So now all four batches of dough are mixed. I've added the salt and they are resting comfortably in their proofing chambers at the appropriate temperatures. So now we start the stretch and fold process. So what I've done is I've taken the standard recipe, which is 30 minute intervals. We usually do four or five stretch and folds. I'd usually do four stretch and folds on this small mass of dough because I divided these all up into 250 gram flour weight bowls. You get a lot more bang for the buck when you're turning, uh, folding a small mass of dough versus a large mass. So four stretch and folds is usually sufficient. That's what I'm gonna do. Loaves two and three, which is our standard tartine at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. Those are at the 30 minute intervals. Then I make adjustments for yeast standard time for loaf number one, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. That's my slow moving loaf. So I'm basically stretching out my stretch and fold times to be longer based on my formula that I derived from the first time I did this experiment. Instead of 30 minute intervals, I'm stretching those out to 45 minute intervals because at that temperature, the yeast thinks that 30 minutes is actually 45 minutes of our time. On the opposite ex extreme for loaf number four, which I'm proofing at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, that one I shortened the stretch and fold times from 30 minutes at standard to 20 minutes between stretch and folds because everything happens faster at those higher temperatures. So 
you don't need to do these adjustments to the times. I could have done all these stretch and folds at 30 minute intervals, and I don't know if it would have made a difference, but I'm really trying to demonstrate this concept of putting yourself in the time frame of the yeast and always thinking about time in our terms equals temperature in the yeast's terms. So if Chad Robertson were a yeast cell and he rewrote the Tartine book, he would have written it with these times because they're based on the temperatures of the yeast. He would have said at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, do the stretch and folds every 30 minutes in human clock time. But if your temperature is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, obviously you would want to do the stretch and folds every 45 minutes because that's in yeast standard time. So now that the dough is all mixed up, I'm going to start the stretching and folding process based on those times that I just outlined. Now this is going to take a couple of hours to do these. There's not a lot to see here with the stretching and folding until we start to get closer to the end of bulk fermentation. Then we can start to go through the bulkomatic criteria and determine when each one of these loaves is finished with bulk fermentation. So I have a couple hours of work to do and I don't want to take up your time. But luckily here at the Institute, in addition to sourdough baking science, I also work on a little bit of time travel science. I don't know if you saw that movie Contact with Jodie Foster, where they get those plans from outer space for that giant gyroscope. And then she goes through the gyroscope and it opens a wormhole and she's gone for like 18 hours, but it only takes a second. I kind of have something like that working here. You can download those plans off of the internet now. That movie came out 28 years ago. So I've created a miniature version of that gyroscope under my sink here using my garbage disposal motor. I can really wind that thing up. It's gonna open a wormhole here. I'm gonna go through there, do a couple hours worth of work and come back in a few seconds of your time. I forgot that the plumbing's all connected down there, so the wormhole goes in under one sink and came out under the other, but you know, it worked. So here's what transpired in the last couple of hours. I've done the stretch and folds for most of the loaves here. Based on the timing, I still have a few more to do on our slow moving loaf number one. But loaf number four, this is our hot loaf, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. This is looking like it's getting close to finishing up bulk fermentation. So let's take a look at it and do the nine criteria test. It's been three and a half hours since we mixed the dough on our 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degree Celsius loaf. This is the loaf that will be done the quickest because of the highest temperature. Let's take a look at the nine criteria on the Balkomatic system. I'll go through all the tests and see where we are. So first thing we always do is take the temperature. We are sitting at 88 degrees Fahrenheit. So a little bit below our target. It's been sitting between 88 and 89 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 31, 31 and a half degrees Celsius, about one degree below where we wanted it to be. So this one didn't quite hit the 90 degree target, but it's really close. In terms of time, this has been going three and a half hours. That would be quick for the standard recipe at the recommended temperature range. Because this is a higher temperature, you would assume that this could be done faster. So three and a half hours is clearly within the range. The percent rise, this is still has a bit of a crown on it from the last stretch and fold that I did, but I'm going to call this at 30%. It has a big dome in the middle and it kind of slopes down on the side. You have to kind of calculate the average in your mind of where that's sitting. I have milliliter markers on the side here of where it started and where 30% is. It's above 30% in the middle. It's right at about the starting point on the side. And I take the average of those and I think this is at about 30%. That's where the mass of dough is sitting. Is the dough domed on top? Clearly very domed on top, both from the last fold, but also you can see the aeration coming up through the dough. Are there bubbles on the top? I see a few, one, two, three small bubbles on top. This isn't really the vigorous bubbling that I've seen in the past, but there are bubbles on the top. Are there bubbles on the side? Absolutely, I'm seeing a lot of bubbles on the side of this dough. The wobble test, this is really the most indicative of where this loaf is. That loaf is super loose. Look at how the loaf is splashing up against the side of the bowl. 
This is what happens when you have a warm temperature loaf. It just gets very loose and you'll start to get gluten breakdown earlier in the process that could be happening here. Let's test that out though by doing the window pane. The window pane is the best way to tell where you are from a gluten development perspective or gluten deterioration. So when I pull a window pane on this, it's a little thin. It break, it's tearing right at the end, but that's a really nice window pane. I can't complain about that at all. Three and a half hours in, I'm getting a little tearing at the very end there, but that's a nice window pane. This is not, you know, at risk of overproofing, but it's starting to get to the end of its life of bulk fermentation where that window pane starts to tear and it starts to get super translucent and breaking apart in your fingers. And then lastly, the smell test. This is a continuum of smell that I look for during bulk fermentation. When you first mix the dough, it smells like flour and water. You know that smell when you're mixing your dough for the first time. That's when it's too early and it's underproofed. The opposite end of the spectrum is when your dough smells like your starter, when it's really acidic and pungent smelling. What we're looking for is something in the middle where the smell of the dough will transition to a ripe smell. So it goes from floury to ripe. Ripe meaning you can start to smell the fermentation like a, a fermenting piece of fruit when it starts to ripen. And then when this gets right in the heart of bulk fermentation, it'll take on a sweet smell. And I can smell that already without even putting my nose into it. Mm. That's the smell I look for where this is a sweet smell. I think this is done based on all the criteria that we've seen here. And again, we can't use the time guidance because we're at a higher temperature than normal, all the other criteria here are falling in the range. So I think this is finished using the bulkomatic criteria. So here's the summary of the chart. And as I mentioned, the top two variables are the ones that we're changing here. We're modifying temperature from the standard and that changes the time from the standard. So those wouldn't be expected to be in the Goldilocks box there. All the other criteria should be the same regardless of what your time and temperature is. And you can see that those all are falling within the desired range, which helps us determine that bulk fermentation is done. What we do next is I don't do pre-shaping or final shaping of these loaves because after we bake up all four of these loaves, I want to inspect the crumb and really focus on how far along we were in bulk fermentation. That's really the essence of this series. And what happens is when you do pre-shaping and final shaping, you can introduce a lot of irregularities into the crumb that can mask how the bulk fermentation actually ended up. So for purposes of these experiments, I don't do pre-shaping or final shaping. I just take the loaf, take the dough out of the bowl, and I flop it into the shaping basket as is, no shaping. But then I have to account for the rest time where the recipe would have called for a 30 minute bench rest between pre-shaping and final shaping because the dough is still fermenting during that time. And if I went directly to the refrigerator with this, I really wouldn't be following the recipe guidance of the 30% rise and that rest bench rest between pre-shaping and final shaping. So let's get this out of the bowl and see how it looks. I also like to see how it feels. So this is coming away from the sides of the bowl really nicely. If this were overproofing, you would start to see those gluten strands really sticking to the side and the dough would start falling apart in my hands. This is still feeling like a cohesive mass of dough that's coming away from the sides. It's super aerated. As I'm touching this, it just feels like a big puffy marshmallow. Then I scoop it out and I look at how that droops down in my hand. That's still pretty firm. That's not a real droopy loaf. I think we caught this right at the right time. I flop this into my shaping basket and that's it. We don't do any shaping on this. We let gravity do the work. As I said, this is how Sir Isaac Newton would do his shaping, let gravity do the work. Then I like to shake that. Oh, that's beautiful. Look at how that's moving. Super aerated loaf. It's still got enough structure in it because you can see the whole loaf moving when I shake it. That's really beautifully proofed. Three and a half hours at roughly 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Now, as I said, we have to leave this on our bench rest for 20 minutes. That's our adjusted time from our yeast standard time where the recipe would have called for 30 because we're at a higher temperature. I'm going for 20. I'm going to bring out all the tools today. I'm going to take, do a continuous probe thermometer read of this for the next 20 minutes on the countertop, just to see what's happening to the dough temperature in that next 20 minutes. 
So this thermometer is settling in at about 84 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 29 degrees Celsius. So between the time I took it out of the bowl, just that action of introducing air as I was basically scooping that out of the bowl, turning it upside down, exposed all that to room temperature air, it lost a few degrees of temperature. That's not uncommon, but it's still sitting at 84 degrees Fahrenheit or 29 degrees Celsius. This is still rapidly fermenting. And I always make this point in these videos, the yeast doesn't know bulk fermentation is done. So when you're doing pre-shaping, you're letting the dough sit on the countertop for the bench rest, it's still fermenting away. So when you cut off your bulk fermentation at a high dough temperature, you're still getting a lot of fermentation time on the bench during the bench rest and when it goes into the refrigerator because that dough temperature is still high. That's why I cut the bench rest down to 20 minutes instead of 30 minutes, which is recommended because of that high dough temperature. I'm gonna stop talking and we're gonna let that sit for another 15 minutes or so. Then I'll get that into the refrigerator and we'll do an overnight cold retard and bake it up in the morning. These loaves look like they will be in the refrigerator for about 14 hours for their cold retard. I'll space out all the timing here so that they all have exactly the same time in the refrigerator. I'll take them out tomorrow and bake them up with the exact same cold retard time. I just finished the 20 minute bench rest on loaf number four. This is our 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius loaf. So it's still sitting at 83 degrees Fahrenheit. That's 28 degrees Celsius. Even though my room temperature is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, this dough temperature didn't move. The dough temperature remains pretty constant when it's sitting here like this. So my point is for the last 20 minutes, this dough has been fermenting like crazy. The yeast didn't know that bulk fermentation stopped. It just got moved from one vessel into another. It's still going. So I just want to point that out, that all the time adds up, not just when you call the end of bulk fermentation time. Now I'm going to put this into the refrigerator. I'm going to leave the probe in, in here so we can see what happens to the temperature in the refrigerator. Now I put that loaf into the refrigerator and I'll continue to monitor that dough temperature every 30 minutes for the next 10 hours or so. But I just wanted to put this chart up because I've done this before. This is essentially what happens when you put dough into the refrigerator. This is incredibly important when you're thinking about temperature. So what you can see from this chart, this was for a loaf that went into the refrigerator at 78 degrees Fahrenheit, 26 degrees Celsius, pretty close to this loaf, a couple degrees colder. When the loaf goes into the refrigerator, it keeps fermenting. The temperature starts to decline, but you can see here, that it took almost four hours for this loaf to get down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. That's active fermentation still going on in those first four hours that it's in the refrigerator. So this is why you can do a cold retard in lieu of a countertop final proof because it's still actively fermenting. Even after it reaches 50 degrees Fahrenheit, it takes almost 10 hours for it to get down to the refrigerator temperature which in this case was 39 degrees Fahrenheit or 3.9 degrees Celsius. So during that time between 50 degrees Fahrenheit and about 40 degrees Fahrenheit, it's still fermenting as well. The yeast doesn't really shut down until it gets down to about 37 degrees Fahrenheit or three degrees Celsius. So when you think about bulk fermentation and final proofing, just think about the temperature of the dough. And what you can see here, it's usually surprising for people when they see this the first time, that temperature stays pretty warm once it goes into the refrigerator. A lot of people think that you call the end of bulk fermentation and somehow the yeast knows it's done and it stops fermenting when it sits on the countertop. Then you put the dough in the refrigerator and people think the dough temperature immediately goes to the refrigerator temperature. It does not. It takes a long time. It takes 10 hours to get to the refrigerator temperature based on some tests that I've done in the past. So loaves number two and three have been bulk fermenting for four hours since we mixed the dough. These are right on the heels of loaf number one. Even though this temperature was lower, these loaves really took off in the last 30 minutes or so. So let's do the bulk matic test. I think these are good to go. Now these should be identical. I'll do both of them just to make sure. But I mixed these from the same batch of dough. They had the same stretch and folds. They've been in the same proofing chamber together the whole time. First thing we always do is do the temperature test. Now these got a little warm, 83 degrees Fahrenheit versus target of 82, 83 degrees Fahrenheit. 
So unlike loaf number four, which ran a little bit below the target of 90 degrees Fahrenheit, it was one or two degrees below. These have been running one or two degrees above. These started out at about 81 degrees Fahrenheit, went up to 82, 83, 84, 83. So these ran a little bit faster than expected at 82. So I would call these roughly about an 83 degree temperature on average. The time, four hours, that's right in the middle of the recommended range per the book. So this is very reasonable that these could be done in four hours. The percent rise really shot up in the last, I'd say 30 minutes or less. These are at probably 40% right now, just took off. Uh, yeah, I'm gonna call that at least 40% rise. These are further along than loaf number four. Are they domed on top? Absolutely, you can see that nice shoulder around the edges there. Really beautiful doming on the top. Are there bubbles on the top? Not a lot, but I see a few. One, two, three over here. One or two here. I'm not seeing that bubbling on the top, but you see a lot of air pushing up. Are there bubbles on the sides? Absolutely, really vigorous. That's like textbook bubbling on the side. These are super aerated lobes, really tall lobes, a lot of air in them. Nice bubbles on the side on that one as well. Now the wobble test, I just like to shake this and look is the dough aerated and loose. And I say, is it splashing against the sides of the bowl? It is. This is not quite as loose as loaf number four, our 90 degree loaf, but it's pretty close. Yeah, I'd say these are very loose and aerated, almost like loaf number four, not quite there. Then the window pane test, this is really our test of gluten sufficiency and to ensure that we're not overproofing the loaves, just to get a sense of where we are. This loaf feels really good. This has more integrity than loaf number four did. So that's not tearing. See, I'm getting a much, much, much better stretch there. It tears at the very end. Let's try loaf number three. Feels very similar to loaf number two. Pull that up. Really beautiful. Beautiful translucent window pane. Just that tearing on the edge. Let me try that again. A little tearing on the edge there. That's a really strong window pane right there. Just tearing on the edges. So this gluten structure is stronger than what I saw in loaf number four and that's consistent with what happens at high temperature. When loaf number four was up in the high 80s or the low 30s Celsius, 80s Fahrenheit, you start to get the protease enzyme that eats the gluten. I felt it when I did the window pane. I'm not feeling it as much here. This is just kind of normal gluten deterioration that you see as you get four hours into bulk fermentation, but it doesn't feel like the dough is breaking apart in my hands. It's just thinning a little bit. And then lastly, I do the smell test. Mm, that's a beautiful sweet smell. This is more sweet than loaf number four. So that's done. These loaves are definitely done. Maybe a little bit further along than loaf number four based on the rise, but the dough is just holding together more. So this is interesting where this dough rose more, it's firmer, and that gives it more of an architecture to lift the dough high in the bowl. Loaf number four, where it started to break down a little bit, the yeast could be putting out the exact same amount of carbon dioxide, but you're losing the architecture of the loaf so you don't see it in the rise. That's, that's a difficulty when you bulk ferment at high temperatures is sometimes the percent rise just doesn't get there as quickly as a loaf at a lower temperature. Okay, these are good to go. Here's the bulk -matic chart for loaves two and three. You can see the percent rise. We overshot the target a little bit there. The time is right in the zone, the temperature is in the zone, and all the other variables are right where we want them to be. These look really good on the chart. Now, these are where we diverge and go down two paths. Loaf number two is going to follow loaf number four into the refrigerator for the overnight cold retard like all the other loaves. Loaf number three, I'm gonna do a countertop proof of three to four hours that's also called for as an option in the book. And then we're going to bake these two loaves up tomorrow with all the other ones. Actually, I'm going to bake up one of these tonight after the countertop proof is done. And this should look exactly the same as the cold retard after 14 hours in the refrigerator tomorrow. That's really the test that we're trying to do is to say that is there parity from a bulk fermentation perspective when you look at the crumb and the shape of the loaf, whether you do a countertop 
final proof or a cold retard in the fridge. That's what we're gonna test with these two loaves. And we'll compare this to loaf number four and loaf number one. So now I scoop loaf number two out and I say, what does it feel like? Very cohesive, feels similar to loaf number four, our warm loaf, but this has more air. My gosh, just beautifully airy loaf. And as I lift it out, I look for my droop test. That's a little more droopy than loaf number one. So that's a little further along. It's just a lot more air in that loaf. It feels really different. Really interesting, that difference in a few degrees of temperature. And then do the wobble test. Look at that. That's a gorgeous loaf. Gorgeous wobble right there. Beautifully proofed. Loaf number three. This is its sibling. Should be identical. These followed the same path, came from the same batch of dough, sat in the proofing chamber next to each other. I can't feel any difference between this loaf and its sister or brother. Scoop it out. Almost identical. That one feels a little firmer for some reason than loaf number two. Wow, that's really something. Look at that. Really nice shake. This loaf does feel and look a little bit firmer than loaf number two. That's loaf number three. So I'm actually gonna do loaf number three on the countertop. I think I said I was gonna do loaf number two, but this looks like it has a little further to go still compared to loaf number two here. So loaf two is gonna go into the fridge for the overnight cold retard. Loaf three, countertop, final proof. I'm also going to put a thermometer in here and measure this one on the countertop for the next three to four hours. You're wondering how many thermometers does this guy have? I have a lot. So both of these loaves will sit on the countertop for the 30 minute bench rest that normally would fall between pre-shaping and final shaping. Then loaf number two goes into their fridge for the cold retard. Loaf number three, we're going to let this countertop proof and bake it up tonight. It has been six hours since we mixed loaf number one. This is our 75 degree loaf that I've had at room temperature for six hours. I think this is done. Let's take a look at where this is. Wow, that one really puffed up. Okay, the bulkomatic test. Let's see what our temperature is. This has been sitting at 75 degrees Fahrenheit. It's sitting at 76 degrees Fahrenheit right now, 24.4 degrees Celsius. So that's been right where we wanted it to be for the six hour duration. The percent rise, now this one similar to loaves one and two really took off. This is almost at 50% rise. Now normally I cut these off at 30%, but when I compare the other tests here, this one just didn't seem quite as aerated even though it was very tall. So I let this one go to 50%. Is it domed on top? Absolutely, this is probably the highest dome of any of the loaves that we've seen. Are there bubbles on the top? One big one here, mm, really just that one bubble on top. Are there bubbles on the side? Yeah, really vigorous bubbling on the side, similar to what we saw in the other loaves. The wobble test, this is where this one's still a little stiff. It's not quite as loose and aerated as we saw in loaves two, three, or four, but I think it's there. I don't wanna let this go much longer. Let's do the window pane test and see if our gluten is holding up. This dough feels really similar to loaves two and three. I'm getting a pretty good stretch on the window pane with some tearing around the edges. Yeah, really similar to two and three. The, the dough is still kind of thick, but it's starting to tear. And then lastly, the smell test. It's that sweet smell, not quite as sweet as loaves two, three, and four, but I think we're there. Just based on the height of this and the other criteria, I think we gotta call that one done. Let me put up the bulkomatic chart so you can see where this one falls. And you see this one's a little bit of a mixed bag where some of these are pushing to the right and a few other ones are to the left. This one is less clear than some of the other loaves. Let me take this out and get it into a shaping basket. We'll see how it feels. Yeah, this feels slightly stiffer than the other loaves, but really nice cohesive aeration. 
and the droop test. Yeah, a little stiff, similar to some of the other lobes, but that, that one may be a hair early, but I think we're gonna call that. It's super aerated. It's really standing up in the pan here. Look at the shake test. Yeah, that's a little stiffer than the other lobes we saw. So this one might be a little bit early at six hours, but we're gonna go for it. We'll give it its 30 minute bench rest here, and then it will go into the refrigerator with the others for the overnight cold retard, and we'll bake them up tomorrow. So while we're here, let's take a look at loaf number three. This has been sitting on the countertop for two hours. This one is really puffing up. I'm a little bit concerned that this is gonna overproof if I let it go much longer. Even though this is on the countertop, it's still sitting at a dough temperature of 78 degrees Fahrenheit. This one you recall bulk fermented at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. It's been sitting here for two hours against the guidance of three to four hours, but it's really rising up out of the pan. So I think I'm gonna call this one done at two hours of a countertop final proof versus the guidance of three to four hours. This loaf is just super active. Flop that out onto parchment paper for scoring. Let's see what this one looks like. Now this loaf is super loose and relaxed. Um, I know that we said we weren't gonna appreciate and final shape these and I'm not, but I am gonna tighten this up a little bit because I know this is just gonna relax more in the pan. So I'm just gonna tuck this in around the edges to try to tighten up this loaf without disturbing the crumb. So I'm not gonna fold it the way that I would normally do a pre-shape or a final shape. I'm just gonna try to get some shape to this loaf. So I just tucked that in on the bottom to try to give that some shape. This still looks like it's really pushing towards overproofing. So we're gonna get this in the oven and bake it up. So I'll bake all these loaves up the same way. I preheat the Dutch oven in the oven at 500 degrees Fahrenheit, that's 260 degrees Celsius. I bake it for 20 minutes with the lid on at 450 degrees, 232 degrees Celsius. Then I take the lid off for about 15 minutes. These bake up in about 35 minutes based on the size of these loaves. I'll bake this one tonight. I'll bake the rest tomorrow, and then we'll cut them all open and compare the crumb to see how the bulk fermentation comes out with these different bulk fermentation times and temperatures. It's the morning of day two and I have baked up loaves one, two, and four. These were the three loaves that went into the refrigerator for the overnight cold retard. I baked up loaf three last night. That was the one that we did on the countertop proof, but let me focus on these three first. So just to recap, loaf number one, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius bulk fermentation for six hours. Loaf number two, 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius. This bulk fermented for four hours. Loaf number four, this was 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius bulk fermentation. This bulk fermented for three and a half hours. So six hours, four hours, three and a half hours. The idea was that if we modified the time, we could adjust for different temperatures and that the loaves should bake up looking exactly the same. If you look at these three loaves, these look incredibly similar. Loaf number two and loaf number four, this is our 80 degree loaf and our 90 degree loaf Fahrenheit, these are almost identical. If I didn't have these flags in here, I could easily get those two mixed up. Loaf number one, this looks slightly different to me. It didn't quite get as much of a pronounced ear on it, and it just has a little bit more of a relaxed shape. It looks like it's a little further along than loaf number two and loaf number four. We'll see when we cut it open. So just looking at the outside of these loaves, very similar. We can say that you can accommodate different bulk fermentation temperatures by adjusting your bulk fermentation time and come up with very, very similar looking loaves. Now let's look at loaf two and three. Now these two, these came from the same batch of dough that bulk fermented at 80 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, and that bulk fermented for four hours. The difference was loaf number two went into the refrigerator for the 14 hour cold retard. Loaf number three, I tried to do a countertop final proof on that 
And you can see here with slope three, the shape of this implies that this started to overproof. It just started to lose its structure. It's very round kind of loaf. It just doesn't have the character of loaf number two. It doesn't have the ear. So you can see here really clearly the difference between the two methods really coming from the exact same bulk fermented dough. You have on my left, the one that went into the refrigerator for the cold retard and the one on my right was the countertop final proof. In addition to that difference in the method of doing the final proofing, loaf number three was supposed to to countertop proof for three to four hours based on the guidance from the recipe. I cut this off at two hours because it was really running away from me and looked like it was about to overproof. So I generally don't do the countertop proofs, so I wasn't really familiar with this method, but I can say that kind of following the recipe by the book, this one looks like it would have overproofed if I had let that go for three to four hours. But you can see some obvious differences here on the exterior of the loaf between the cold retarded loaf number two and the countertop final proof loaf number three. We'll see when we cut them open how they look. Now the idea behind this series, when is bulk fermentation done, is that we change up certain variables and we see if we can use the incredible bulkomatic indicator system that we developed here at the Institute to determine when bulk fermentation is done. In today's video, we changed the bulk fermentation temperature and then we adjusted the time accordingly. But the only way you can really tell if you caught them at the same time is to cut them open and see what the crumb looks like. Now, if you recall, I did not do any pre-shaping or final shaping of these loaves. This is essentially bulk fermented dough. So what we're seeing here when I cut these open is the impact of bulk fermentation without any of the irregularities that get added sometimes when you do pre-shaping and final shaping. That's the only reason I don't do the shaping in this series of experiments. So loaf number one, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, six hours bulk fermentation. Let's see what it looks like. That is a really nicely proofed loaf. I would say that that is maybe pushing towards overproofing. It's definitely on the overproofing end of the continuum of a fully proofed loaf. The reason I can tell that is just because of the size of the holes here. Even though there's some nice distribution of small, medium, and large holes, what I see here is this cluster of these really small honeycomb looking holes here which starts to indicate that we're getting towards overproofing, but that is really a beautifully proofed loaf. The crust also looks a little bit thin to me, um, which implies sometimes that you're pushing towards overproofing. When I look at the proofing, I also look at the holes really from top to bottom and end to end of each side of the loaf. That is really fully proofed right up to the edges, really nice. Here's a closer look at this if you want to inspect that crumb in some more detail. Loaf number two, this is our 80 degree Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius bulk fermented loaf. This one went for four hours. So two hours less than loaf number one. This is close to the classic tartine guidance of 78 to 82 degrees Fahrenheit. We were on the high end of that at 82. I typically bulk ferment these closer to 80, but this one should look like a typical tartine loaf that I make. This one also did the cold retard in the refrigerator for 14 hours. Really beautiful. Now that's kind of the classic open irregular crumb that you see with the tartine loaf. That is a beautifully fermented loaf of bread right there. Again, I look end to end, I look top to bottom. I see the nice distribution of small, medium and large holes. And this loaf has a little bit more of that irregularity. Some of those bigger holes there in the middle that you get following tartine by the book. And this can be the result of of fermenting in that temperature range. You, you can get a different looking crumb at 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius, than you get at 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. You can see that's just a little bit more closed crumb on the 74 degree loaf. That one might've also just fermented a little bit longer. It's very difficult to, to separate the impact of temperature and time, but you can see some difference between those two loaves. 
Here's a closer look at the crumb of loaf number two if you want to pause and look at that in more detail. Loaf number three. This is a bit of an outlier in this group because we did not do the overnight cold retard. I tried a countertop final proof. This one bulk fermented exactly the same as loaf number two, 82 degrees Fahrenheit, 28 degrees Celsius for four hours. Really interesting. I'd say that's another really nicely proofed loaf. Just the shape of the loaf didn't open up the way that the other ones did. So this countertop proof, if you recall, I cut this off after two hours because this looked like it was heading towards overproofing, and I actually think it was. The more I look at this in detail, I'm seeing this compressed crumb on the top and this, these dense kind of honeycombs that I saw in loaf number one. This is pushing towards overproofing, but not bad. Some people would say this is a beautifully proofed, fully proofed loaf. Now let's compare this to its sibling. This is loaf number two. Now that's just a dramatic difference between those two. So on my left, loaf number two, these were the exact same batch of dough. Loaf number two was our cold retard for 14 hours. Loaf number three was the countertop final proof for two hours. Just a dramatic difference between those two. Can you still get a decent looking loaf by doing a countertop proof? I'm sure you can, but I just think that my timing and my eye is a little bit more geared towards the overnight cold retard, which is what I typically do. That's the reason loaf number two looks better. If I had to speculate, I would say if I were trying to, to follow this recipe and I planned on doing that countertop final proof at room temperature, I probably would have cut this loaf off a little bit earlier now that I see what this looks like because I was looking at another three to four hours at room temperature, which was 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius. I probably should have cut this off at a 20% rise, for example, instead of a 30% rise to just allow a little bit more margin of error for so that you don't get into the overproofing territory when you do that countertop final proof. But that's a nicely proofed loaf of bread right there. Here's a more detailed look at loaf number three if you want to pause the video. Loaf number four. This is the 90 degree Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. This is a warm loaf. This is what you would be baking if you live in a very warm climate or if you're baking in a very hot day in the summer without your air conditioning on. This is really the test of can you make a decently bulk fermented loaf in a very, very warm uh, room temperature or warm kitchen. And it's also testing, could I speed up the process by using a proofing chamber at 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, and just cut down the time from the standard recommended recipe. I've tried this a couple of times and I've failed every time. I call this the elusive 90 degree loaf. Let's see how this one came out. Wow, look at that. That's a beautifully proofed loaf. At 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius. Again, top to bottom, end to end. Now this one is not pushing as much towards overproofing as some of those prior ones where we saw the real dense honeycomb. Let's compare to loaf number one. See loaf number one, very similar, but the shape of the loaf is a little different. So this implies that there was a little bit of overproofing here. I didn't get the ear. Then I got this little dense area here in loaf number one that I'm not seeing in loaf number four. That's the difference of 20 or 30 minutes, maybe, in bulk fermentation. Compare this to loaf number two. Loaf number two is my 82 degree loaf. That one really still opened up the most. Maybe because the tartine recipe, which, is, which I'm using, is really calibrated for that style of crumb at that temperature. You really see that result there. Loaf number three, sorry, loaf number four, was a little bit further along here in the proofing. This could have possibly been cut off a little bit earlier. This big hole on the bottom is just an air bubble because I didn't do shaping of these loaves. You'll get some irregularities like that. That's not an indication of anything else. But loaf number four, really beautiful. Here's a more detailed look at loaf number four if you wanna pause the video.
So here's the essence of the experiment in one picture. Can you bulk ferment loaves at very different bulk fermentation temperatures and get the same result? Absolutely. I mean, look at these. This is loaf one, two, and four. These were the three different temperatures that went into the cold retard. Very, very similar results. Now, sometimes at this point in the video, I'll go ahead and slice the loaves to try to show that there may be some irregularities in the bisection and the loaves actually will look more similar when you get into the slices. These loaves look so similar in the bisection. I don't want to waste your time by slicing these because I know that they will look even more similar if I slice deeper into the loaves and then I would lay them out and I would say, look how similar the slices look. And then I would say, if I mixed up the slices, I wouldn't be able to put them back into the original loaves. These are in such a narrow window of proofing that I would even get these mixed up if I started slicing them and didn't have the labels on them. This is really an extraordinary outcome. So I was going to do a taste test on these loaves, but they came out looking so good that I want to give them away to family members and nobody likes to have a bite taken out of their loaf. So I'm not going to do the taste test today. And I guess if we wanted to do the taste test, I'll have to do the experiment again, maybe shorter next time. So now I'd like to just share a few other findings from this experiment so that you can take what we've learned here and use this in your baking. First, I want to talk about what happens to the loaves when you take the loaf and put it into the refrigerator for the cold retard. Now, yesterday I showed this chart, which was a chart that I've used from other experiments that shows what typically happens when you put a loaf into the refrigerator. And here you can see it starts at 78 degrees Fahrenheit and it takes about four hours to get down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit or 10 degrees Celsius. I view that as kind of a break point in the significant fermentation down to kind of slow fermentation after it gets below 50. And then the fermentation shuts down when it gets down to 37 degrees Fahrenheit or three degrees Celsius. So I took this chart and now what I've done is overlaid loaf number four, where if you recall, I put the continuous probe thermometer in loaf number four when that went in the fridge. And you can see the black lines on here pretty closely follow that standard temperature chart. So, so we started at a little bit higher temperature, 84 degrees Fahrenheit, 29 degrees Celsius going into the fridge. But then you can see for that loaf number four, the temperature dropped faster than my baseline standard loaf. And it got down to 50 degrees Fahrenheit at the three hour mark versus the standard that I showed yesterday, which got down to 50 degrees or 10 degrees Celsius at three and a half hours. So a half hour difference to get down to that temperature. And then you can see it dropped pretty significantly faster down to 42 degrees Fahrenheit or 5.5 degrees Celsius at the four hour mark versus the standard I use, which took six and a half hours to get down to 42 degree temperature. Now, why did this happen? There are two things to remember when you're cold proofing loaves in the refrigerator. One is the size of the loaf makes a difference. The standard chart that I showed earlier was for a loaf that was larger in size than these loaves. That standard chart is for a 330 gram flour weight loaf. It's a little bit bigger than these. These are 250 gram flour weight loaves. So the reason that this chart dropped quicker, the temperature dropped more quickly for loaf number four, really all the loaves in this experiment is because the loaves were smaller. When you put a smaller mass of dough into the refrigerator, the, the center of the dough cools more quickly than if you have a large mass of dough. Makes perfect sense, but until you really see it on paper, sometimes it's hard to imagine what's happening there. So always remember that when you put your loaves into the refrigerator, the size of the dough will impact how long it ferments in the refrigerator because it takes longer for that refrigerator temperature to penetrate to the center of a large loaf. The second thing, which isn't a factor here, but it can be a factor, is that different shelves in your refrigerator or different spots in your refrigerator will have different temperatures. Now, every time I put my loaves into the refrigerator, I put a thermometer with them so I know what the temperature is exactly of those loaves in that spot in the refrigerator. And what I find is that in my refrigerator, the back and the bottom of the refrigerator is much colder than the top and the front of the refrigerator. So if I put these loaves on my bottom shelf, they'll settle in at about 36, 37 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about three degrees Celsius. That's the, the final 
refrigerator temperature that they get to. If I put these on the top shelf, sometimes depending on what time of year it is, they'll be 41, 42 degrees Fahrenheit. That's significantly higher temperature and has a significant impact on the fermentation of the loaf, five degrees Fahrenheit or maybe two degrees Celsius. So always put a thermometer in your refrigerator with your loaves so that you know where your hot spots and your warm spots are. And the reason that's important is because I use that knowledge to control the fermentation when it goes into the refrigerator. So for example, if I pulled a loaf out of bulk fermentation and when I was shaping it up, I said, wow, this loaf still feels a little stiff. This probably could have gone a little further. I'll put that on my top shelf in the refrigerator where it's a little warmer and I'll try to catch up a little bit of that proofing in the fridge. Conversely, if I take a loaf out of bulk fermentation and when I shape it, it is really overproofed. I'll put that on my bottom shelf where it's the coldest because I want to get that down to the refrigerator temperature as quickly as possible. So, so knowing your refrigerator temperature is an important tool for controlling that last mile or that last segment of your fermentation time. Now the next thing I want to talk about is what happens to your loaf when you put it into the oven. So I put mine in the preheated Dutch oven with the lid on. Here's a chart that shows what happens to the temperature. This is the internal dough temperature of a loaf while it's baking. So this loaf came out of the refrigerator. This is not one of the loaves I baked yesterday. I did this a couple of days ago. The loaf goes into the oven at, in this case, 49 degrees Fahrenheit, 9.4 degrees. That's the internal temperature of the dough. And then you can see it gradually climb. You see the minutes there at the bottom, climbing, climbing, climbing. And then I remove the lid after 20 minutes. The internal dough temperature at that point is 180 degrees Fahrenheit, 82.2 degrees Celsius. Then interestingly, once I remove the lid, the curve really flattens out. I don't really know the reason for this. I think with the lid on, you're just concentrating more of that radiant heat right onto the dough with the lid on. When you take that lid off, you're getting more of the convection heat from the oven and the curve typically, any kind of heat curve like this will tend to flatten out as it gets higher, but there's a real inflection point here when you remove the lid. And then it will gradually creep up from that time, 200 degrees, 205, 209, 210 degrees Fahrenheit, approaching eventually 212 degrees, which is the boiling point or 100 degrees Celsius. So this is an interesting chart from a baking perspective, but you're probably asking the question, what does this have to do with the subject of this video, which is fermentation? Take a closer look at the temperatures on the beginning of this chart. When the loaf goes into the oven, it's at 49 degrees Fahrenheit or 9.4 degrees Celsius. The yeast thinks it's still in the refrigerator. And then at five minutes, it's 67 degrees Fahrenheit or 19.4 degrees Celsius. The yeast thinks it's on the countertop. It's still fermenting. So it's warmed up again from the refrigerator temperature where it was asleep. And now the yeast is fermenting again. Then it goes a little bit further along at seven minutes, we're at the 80 degree mark, 27 degrees Celsius. Now the yeast thinks it's comfortably resting in the proofing chamber. It's still fermenting. Then you start to get up to the 11 minute mark or at 112 degrees Fahrenheit, 44 degrees Celsius. The yeast is saying it's getting a little warm in here. This guy better turn down the temperature of the proofing chamber. And then unfortunately at the 13 minute mark, 132 degrees Fahrenheit or 55 degrees Celsius, that's the die-off point of the yeast where the yeast dies a fiery death in your oven. So it's very important to remember that the last stage of fermentation, I call this the last gasp of fermentation, happens in the oven. Before the loaf starts fully baking, the yeast heats up again and it starts fermenting again because the yeast only knows temperature. It doesn't realize it's in the oven for the first 13 minutes or so. So when you think about did your loaf overproof or underproof, you also have to take into account this first 13 minutes or so in the oven because that's the last step of fermentation. So this is just another interesting chart so that you have the full suite of tools when you're thinking about temperature with respect to sourdough baking. Now the thing that I don't show on here uh, is the external temperature or the crust temperature of the loaf because that's when you get what's called the Maillard reaction, which is the caramelization or the darkening of the loaf that you can see here on loaf number two. Those different colors, the blistering, that mahogany color on the uh, ear, 
That's called the Maillard reaction, and it's when sugars and amino acids come out to the surface, and then they hit a temperature of around 300 degrees Fahrenheit or 180 degrees Celsius. And just for the record, here's the recap of all the times that I used for these four loaves, including my adjustments for what I called yeast standard time, where I adjusted some of the rest times during the bulk fermentation process. That has all the details with the actual times at the end of the experiment. So the last topic I want to talk about is comparing this experiment to the prior time I did this experiment in the other video, bulk fermentation, mastering temperature and time. I used the exact same temperature ranges, the three ranges and baked four loaves. And the times came out different between the two. So let me put this up on the chart on the screen. And you can see in, in yesterday's bulk fermentation, it was six hours, four hours and 3.5 hours for the three loaves that we made shown, shown in the first column. The last time I did this experiment, it was seven and a half hours, five hours, and three and a half hours. So the, the 90 degree loaf came out the same at three and a half hours. The other two started to diverge from the, the two experiments. So you ask the question, how could this happen? And your first thought is maybe the temperature was different, but we controlled for temperature in both of these experiments, highly controlled for temperature. I used the exact same recipe. I used the same flour. I used, everything was exactly the same and the bulk fermentation times came out differently in these two bakes. How is that possible? The reason is because of the strength of my starter. The strength of your starter can have a profound impact on your bulk fermentation times, even from one day to the next. A strong starter can almost cut in half your bulk fermentation times versus a weak starter. If you haven't seen episode six of this series, watch episode six. The results of that were extraordinary. They were mind blowing. When I compared two exact same experiments, one with a strong starter, one with a weak starter, the bulk fermentation times were wildly different. So always be aware of that, that your starter strength is a big variable in the bulk fermentation time equation. So what did we learn from this experiment? I would say a lot. Let me see if I can quickly summarize that. And you're probably saying, yeah, quickly, right? Okay, first, it is possible to adjust your bulk fermentation times to account for differences in bulk fermentation temperatures. Very clearly proven, three and a half hours, four hours, six hours, exactly the same crumb. It's very easy to do that if you have a good tool for determining when bulk fermentation is done. The second thing is that yeast can't tell time. Yeast only knows the temperature and you can control the speed of your yeast by changing the temperature. Turn the temperature up, it goes faster. Turn the temperature down, it goes slower. However, when you work at higher temperatures, remember, you also change the chemistry of the dough. So when you get up to high temperatures, your dough becomes more acidic, you release the protease enzyme, and it tends to lead to overproofing. When you get your temperatures up close to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, that's a real danger zone, and you need to be real careful when you're working at those higher temperatures because bad things can happen in a hurry. We were able to avoid that here by using a technique called deacidification of my starter. So because I knew I was going to be bulk fermenting at high temperatures and I knew that acidity was a risk and the protease enzyme loves acidity, I wanted to give the yeast a head start. So I did multiple feedings, frequent feedings of my starter in the two days before I baked these loaves and that got the acidity level down. So it lets the starter get a head start. It gets, it's able to rise the dough quickly before the lactic acid bacteria is able to increase the acidity of the loaf and release the protease enzyme, that process works. I really proved that out and I haven't really done that a lot, but I'm certain that that's the reason this loaf number four, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, shows no signs of overproofing at all. That's pretty extraordinary. Then we got into mixing the dough and controlling our temperature as we were mixing. And what you saw here was that you can get some wild swings in your dough temperature when you're mixing your dough. 
much more of a swing in temperature than you get in your proofing chamber. So if you're trying to significantly increase or decrease your dough temperature, your first best option is to do that in mixing through controlling your water temperature. And that's using something called the desired dough temperature calculator. There's a standard one out there. It kind of works if you're within the realm of room temperature. When you start to get outside of room temperature and you're moving towards higher temperatures and trying to really raise the temperature of your dough by using very hot water, that desired dough temperature calculator, the standard one you'll find on the internet, does not really work very well. And I recommend using the one that I showed here in this video, the gram weighted and density adjusted version. Then I demonstrated how to use a proofing chamber. You have a lot of options to create an inexpensive proofing chamber in your kitchen, or you could just go buy a proofing box if you wanna spend the money. But the idea behind a proofing chamber is that it allows you to keep your dough at a temperature different than your room temperature. It's very important. And when you're managing your dough in a proofing chamber, what we showed is that it takes a while for the dough temperature to move. It's very slow to move by, by managing that proofing chamber temperature. And you just have to be patient and avoid the temptation of trying to jack up the temperature in your proofing chamber. Because if you get above 90 degrees Fahrenheit or 32 degrees Celsius, you superheat the outside edge of the dough, you release the protease enzyme, and you head down the path of overproofing. When you're proofing dough in a proofing chamber, always take your dough temperature and don't just rely on the proofing chamber temperature because I had a thermometer in the oven that was saying the oven temperature was 86 degrees, my dough temperature was 81 degrees because the dough temperature moves so slowly. And then late in bulk fermentation, that process can reverse because dough, when it's fermenting, is exothermic. That means it creates heat. It becomes its own heating element so if I was just looking at my temperature in my proofing chamber and it said it was at a comfortable 82 degrees Fahrenheit, my dough could be up at 83, 84, 85, 86 degrees Fahrenheit because it's generating its own heat late in the fermentation process. One other point that I did not mention earlier in the video is that I normally cut all of these loaves off at a 30% rise because that's usually the high end of what's recommended here in the tartine recipe and on the Balkamatic system. But as I was monitoring these loaves, I wasn't getting all the variables in the desired range when they were at 30%. So loaf number four, the warm loaf, we rose that 30%, but then loaf number two, which was our 80 degree Fahrenheit, 28 degree Celsius loaf, I rose that one 40% before all the variables were in the range. And loaf number one, which is our cooler loaf, 75 degrees Fahrenheit, 24 degrees Celsius, I rose that one 50% before all, all the other variables got in the range. And loaf number one may have pushed over proofing a little bit because I also went about 20 minutes longer than I wanted to, as I mentioned earlier. But the point is that the percent rise in the dough is relative to the bulk fermentation temperature. This is really important and I've never seen this documented in any recipes. And what I mean by that is when your dough is bulk fermenting at a warm temperature, 90 degrees Fahrenheit, 32 degrees Celsius, you're not going to get as much of a rise in that dough, even though the yeast activity may be exactly the same, because the gluten is starting to break down, the gluten's starting to weaken just at a warmer temperature. It's starting to break down because of the protease enzyme, and the yeast is starting to slow down because the acidity is rising as the lactic acid bacteria loves warmer temperatures and it rises the acidity of the loaf. So you have all this downward pressure on the architecture of the dough. It's like you're trying to build a house, but the termites are eating the, the, the structure of your house from the bottom up. So you build the first floor, the second floor, the third floor, and they've eaten the first floor. So you're kind of fighting this constant battle where the dough is trying to rise at the same time that it's sinking, essentially. That happens in warm or acidic environments. The opposite end of the spectrum, 75 degree Fahrenheit, 20, 24 degree Celsius loaf, that was loaf number one, that puffed up so quickly, that grew from 30% to 50% in a matter of minutes, probably less than 30 minutes, because the architecture of the loaf is sound. It's, it has low acidity because of the low temperature. Because of the low temperature, the protease enzyme is kept in the closet. It's not deteriorating the architecture of the loaf. 
So as the yeast is working, nothing's impeding the yeast because of the low acidity. The loaf's not collapsing. So it may be giving off the exact same amount of carbon dioxide as we saw in the warm loaf, but the architecture of the loaf allows the loaf to rise more. And this is incredibly confusing when you read recipes, but you'll find a pattern out there. Some sourdough recipes will call for a doubling during bulk fermentation. And if you read closely, the vast majority of those are bulk fermenting at a low temperature, 70 degrees Fahrenheit, 21 degrees Celsius, because that architecture of the loaf will stand up longer. And when you start to use recipes like tartine, which, which bulk ferment at 80 degrees Fahrenheit or 27 degrees Celsius, it calls for a 30% rise because you don't have that same architecture of the dough that you have in a cooler loaf. Now I'll do some more experiments on this topic, but that was really evident in what I saw here today, and I'm sure there's more to learn on that topic. So in summary, finally, sourdough baking is all about bulk fermentation and bulk fermentation is all about mastering the interplay of temperature and time. If you can cut off bulk fermentation at the right point and appropriately bulk ferment your dough, 80% of the end result of sourdough baking happens during bulk fermentation. It happens right here that you're looking at it. We took a basic recipe from a book, we mixed the ingredients, but then I used every tool in my toolbox, every skill that I had to manage bulk fermentation across three wildly different temperature ranges. We got them to end up the same way. I did no pre-shaping, no final shaping, threw the dough into a shaping basket, and these are the loaves that I got because of what we did in bulk fermentation. That's where the action happens, but it's complicated. There's a lot going on, and it's difficult to know what's going on because it's invisible. Unless you're taking the temperature constantly, unless you can visualize what's happening with the yeast, with the lactic acid bacteria, with the protease enzyme, it's very hard to know what's going on. And that's why a lot of people give up on sourdough baking. I hope you don't give up because it is a learnable skill. And this is the point in the video where I usually say, good luck on your sourdough journey. Now I'm going to eat some bread, but I'm actually not gonna eat this bread today because I'm going to give it away. Although it's tempting but maybe I'll pull some bread out of the freezer. They say man cannot live on bread alone, but I'm certainly giving it a shot. Thanks for watching my video.